Que todos los minutos tarde. No, Uh, yeah, um, there are some friends there. I went through it up to the other people. Maybe only a few strangers. We just started the first. So we want to. My test. 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 Mic test. Mic test. Mic test. Okay. No, so Muhammad is just like I show Muhammad is just like I said, how do you like it? Oh, so you can do it. So, uh, hello and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the 23rd lecture in uh, computer architecture. Uh, today we'll be discussing uh, cutting edge research in uh, computer architecture. So we'll be looking at six, uh, six works which have been published in the recent past. And uh, I'll start with, uh, uh, in the first part, I'll start with three works which with the focus on storage systems. And uh, uh, I mean, we'll, uh, we'll first look at a very interesting work on in-flash processing and slight, and go higher in the compute hierarchy as, uh, as we progress. So uh, the first work is called Flash Cosmos uh, in-flash bulk bitwise operations using inherent computation capability of non-flash memory. And uh, this work was published in Micro 2022. So I'll, I'll start with a executive summary. Uh, so the background is uh, bulk bitwise operations like bitwise and bitwise or, they are widely used uh, computation primitives in some of the most data intensive applications like uh, databases, graph processing, cryptography. Uh, so the problem with uh, performing bulk bitwise operations in current systems is that their performance and energy efficiency are bottlenecked by the data movement between storage and compute unit uh, in traditional systems and in storage processing. And also uh, the serial reading of operands uh, in uh, prior in-flash processing techniques. And also the 
Um, more important uh, limitation is that prior in-flash processing techniques do not provide very high reliability during computation. So, so the goal is to uh, goal of this work is to improve uh, performance, energy efficiency, and uh, reliability of bulk bitwise operations in uh, using in-flash processing. And to this end, we propose uh, Flash Cosmos, uh, which is flash computation with one-shot multi-operand sensing. Uh, this is an in-flash processing technique that is based on two key ideas. One uh, is called multi-word line sensing, which enables uh, multi-operand bulk bitwise operations using a single sensing operation. Uh, when I talk, when I say sensing, you can consider it as a read operation. And enhanced SLC mode programming, which increases the voltage margin between the different states of the uh, programmed cell, and uh, that provides higher reliability during in-flash computation. So looking at some key results, uh, Flash Cosmos was, ev was evaluated using um, 160 real 3D NAND flash chips. And we also performed a system level evaluation uh, using a state-of-the-art SSD simulator, MQSIM, and we chose three real-world applications. Uh, flash Cosmos provided uh, provides uh, performance and energy efficiency improvements by 3.5 times and 3.3 times over the state-of-the-art uh, in-flash processing technique. And it also provides very high reliability during computation. So with this, I'll, I'll quickly jump to the outline of this talk. I'll start with uh, the problem, goals, and key idea. So as I mentioned, bulk bitwise operations are uh, very important uh, computation primitives in data-intensive applications. You can find them in uh, databases, genome analysis, cryptography, graph processing, and many more applications. So the problem with uh, performing bulk bitwise operations in current systems is the uh, data movement, which significantly affects the performance and energy efficiency. Now let's look at what this data movement is uh, in a bit more detail. So here we start with a conventional system that we all, all have now, where uh, uh, we, the most of the operands are stored in the storage system because they don't fit into main memory, and the computation is performed in the host, uh, in the CPU or the GPU. So here we show the memory hierarchy where we have the host computation unit, the main memory, and the storage uh, where the data operands where the operands reside. And to perform the computation, we need to move large amounts of data. Uh, through the memory hierarchy to the computation unit and then move them back. So if we look at the, uh, the memory bandwidth of these devices, we see that the external I.O. bandwidth of the storage uh, device is uh, significantly less than the memory bandwidth, main memory bandwidth. And this can be a bottleneck when we perform this data movement. And so this is the main bottleneck in conventional systems. Now, uh, to mitigate the data movement, we uh, there are many prior works which propose near data processing for bitwise operations at different levels of memory hierarchy. Uh, we look at uh, compute cache in SRAM, uh, AMBIT on DRAM-based main memory, and so on. But our focus is mainly on uh, uh, two techniques, which is in-storage in processing and in-flash processing. This is because uh, these techniques help when the the data set is quite large and they don't fit in the main memory. Now let's look at in-storage processing. And uh, in-storage processing uses uh, in-storage compute units, uh, which can be embedded cores of or FPGA to uh, perform the computation and only send the computation results out of the storage device. So you can see the in-storage computation units here and they uh, that is connected with multiple flash chips over uh, shared channels. So here, as, as I mentioned, the computation is performed in the in-storage compute units and the data is, uh, the result, only the results are moved uh, outside the device. This significantly mitigates the data movement overhead, but there is also a large amount of data movement happening from the flash chips where the data is actually stored to the in-storage compute unit. And uh, if you look at the internal bandwidth of the uh, storage system or, or, the, or an SSD, then we it's it's not significantly higher than the external I/O bandwidth. So this can be the new bottleneck in, in storage processing. Now we will move the computation further closer to the to where the data resides, and uh, we look at in in flash processing, where the computation is performed within the flash chips, and uh, we see that even uh, 
through the internal flash channels, the, only the results are being transferred, which means that the computation happens within the flash chips. So this, this fundamentally mitigates the data movement, but we will look at uh, a few limitations of prior approaches in, in flash processing next. So uh, we look at one prior approach, which is Parabit, which was published at Micro 2021. And uh, this, up, this technique performs bulk bitwise operations uh, inside the flash chips by intelligently controlling the uh, latching circuit of the page buffer. So I'll show a, a very high level uh, figure of the flash chip and uh, uh, there are a bunch of flash pages uh, in this uh, flash chip and also uh, there is a page buffer. Sorry, I think I moved. Yeah, so you can see a bunch of flash pages and uh, page buffer. So uh, when we are performing bulk bitwise operations, typically we store each operand in a flash page. And uh, let's say here we have 32 operands. So for, to perform a bitwise operation, we need to uh, perform a read operation for every operand. And the read operation basically brings the operand to the page buffer. So when we perform the second read, the, the bitwise and operation of those two operands uh, is accumulated in the uh, page buffer. So this has to be done uh, serially for every operand, which uh, which is uh, to which for which the AND operation has to be performed. So uh, if you have 32 operands, we need to perform the sensing 32 times, and only the result is transferred outside the flash chip. So Parabit significantly reduces the data movement, as we saw earlier, but the serial sensing of uh, the operands is the key bottleneck in uh, for performance and energy efficiency in Parabit. Now, uh, there is another limitation which is uh, more important in term, uh, because reliability is, is a key uh, aspect in uh, flash memory because flash memory is inherently a error prone substrate. And uh, we typically use uh, random data randomization and uh, error, error correction modules uh, to, perf to in improve the reliability of computation or data storage. But these techniques cannot be leveraged by in-flash processing because the flash, uh, the computation happens in the flash chip and these uh, techniques are present in the SSD controller or in the in-storage compute unit. So they, if we have to leverage these, they, then there is a large data movement that has to be performed uh, to improve the reliability. So with uh, Parabit, what happens is if there are op errors in the, in the operands, then these errors can um, these errors get persisted in the in the output, and they and over time they can also get accumulated. They can also increase uh, in the in the computation output. So the goal of this uh, work is to address the bottleneck of in-flash processing, which is serial sensing of operands, and also make the in-flash processing more reliable and provide high computation uh, accurate computation results. So. To this end, we propose Flash Cosmos, which performs computation on multiple operands with a single sensing operation. And uh, it also provides accurate results by eliminating Robit errors in the stored data. So here we look at the same figure again with uh, 32 operands stored in each Flash page. And with Flash Cosmos, we can do one single read operation, which brings all the, which, bring, which performs the computation and, uh, uh, and the output is available in the page buffer. So now uh, with this uh, background and motivation, uh, we we'll look at uh, we we'll, we'll look at look at some uh, background of NAND flash memory and uh, and try to understand the key ideas of flash cosmos. So uh, I'll start with a NAND flash cell. Uh, a flash cell stores data by adjusting the amount of charge in the cell. So if if in a cell there is low charge level, then we call it as an as a array cell and uh, it stores a bit value one. And if the cell is programmed, then it has high charge level and it stores the value zero. And when we activate these cells, the array cell operates as a resistor and uh, the programmed cell operates as an open switch. So when we uh, connect these uh, flash cells in a, in a serial manner, it forms an AND string. And these every AND string is connected to a bit line. And during a read operation, uh, the what we do is we pass the bit line current through the NAND string and uh, the cells that we don't want to read, which are called non-target cells, they are uh, activated with a high pass-through voltage and uh, this they operate as 
resistors irrespective of the data that is stored. And the cell that is that we want to read or we want to activate is called the target cell, which operates as resistors or open switches depending on the charge present in the cell. So during a read operation, the bit line current flows through the NAND string. And if all the cells that are there in the string are, operate as resistors, then the, the sense amplifier at the end of the NAND string detects the bit line current and it uh, the output is considered as one. Now, if there is a NAND string where uh, the, one of the cells is in the programmed state and uh, it operates as an open switch, then during the read operation, the bit line current gets blocked. And this means that the, the sense amplifier will not detect the bit line current and it, the value is, is read as zero. So with this, we look at uh, how a NAND flash block is uh, uh, organized and we see a number of NAND strings connected to different bit lines um, laid horizontally. Uh, and uh, this, this comprises a block. And we also connect uh, and the, these cells that, are, that belong to different uh, NAND strings horizontally, and this forms the word line. So a word line uh, controls, a high, controls a large number of flash cells, and this provides high bit level parallelism. Now, uh, we have seen one block. Now we look at multiple blocks, but these blocks share, share the bit lines. So when we look at this kind of an organization, we, what we, we derive two key insights from this uh, organization. So when we look at a NAND string uh, connected in a block, in, in, within a block, we see some parallels in, uh, to a digital AND logic because the cells uh, are connected in, C, in series there. And also similarly in, in an AND uh, circuit, we see that transistors are connected in series. When we look at uh, NAND strings connected in different uh, blocks, what we see is that they are connected in parallel, which is similar to what we get in a digital or circuit. So with this background, I'll, I'll discuss the key ideas of uh, Flash Cosmos. So Flash Cosmos, as I mentioned, has two key uh, techniques. One is uh, multi-word line sensing to enable in Flash uh, bulk bitwise operations with a single sense read operation. And the other uh, technique is enhanced SLC mode programming to eliminate the raw bit errors. So we'll start with uh, uh, performing bitwise and using Flash Cosmos. And uh, we, we simultaneously activate multiple word lines in the same block to perform a bitwise and operation. And we call this intra-block MWS. So here we show a simple uh, figure of a block with multiple word lines. And um, if we, uh, we, we would like to activate only two word lines, word line one and word line two, and the other word lines, the cells in the other word lines are non-target cells. So when we activate them, activate these word lines uh, simultaneously, the bit line current flows through the uh, each NAND string. And only if all the cells in the NAND string are uh, operate as resistors, then the value is read as, the output is read as one. And this is similar to the bitwise AND uh, logic. Now we look at another example where uh, we, uh, we activate all four word lines and the, the, the bit line current get block, gets blocked in all the NAND strings. And here, as, as I mentioned, the, the bit line reads as zero when, all, when even a single target cell uh, stores the value zero or operates as an open switch. So this is again, similar to the bitwise and uh, output. So intra-block MWS enables bitwise and of multiple pages in the same block with a single sensing operation. Now we look at how we can perform bitwise or operation uh, of the stored data in the word lines. And to do this, we simultaneously activate word lines in different blocks. So uh, this we call it as inter-block inter MWS. And here we show two, ex two uh, blocks and a word line in each block. And when we simultaneously activate these two word lines, we see that uh, the value is read as zero. Uh, the output is zero when all the target cells store the value zero. Similarly, when we activate multiple word lines in uh, word lines in different blocks, uh, even if there is a single cell which which is erased and operates as a resistor, because they are connected in parallel, the the value is still read as a one, 
and as you can see here there are two cells which which are open switches but there is one cell which is a resistor which operates as a resistor so interblock mws enables bitwise or of uh, multiple pages in different blocks with a single read operation so in the in the paper we have also shown that uh, flash cosmos can enable other types of bit oper bitwise operations like not nand xor xnor some of these techniques can be done some of these operations can be done by leveraging the existing features of nand flash memory and we also exploit de morgan's law to uh, perform some of these operations and i would refer you to the paper for uh, for uh, to know more about this now next we look at enhanced slc mode programming um, and uh, um, the goal is to eliminate raw bit errors in the stored data and in the computation results so the key idea is to program only a single bit per cell uh, which is called slc mode programming and you may have uh, known this from uh, some of the earlier lectures uh, with slc mode programming what we do is we trade pro storage density for reliable computation but slc mode programming is is just not enough to uh, not to get error free computation because uh, uh, even with without randomization and without ecc slc can also be error prone so what we do is we perform more precise programming of the cells and uh, this means that we increase the reliability margin between the different states of the cells and by doing that what we do is we trade the programming latency for more reliable computation so esp uh, or enhanced enhanced slc mode programming enables reliable in flash computation by trading storage density and programming latency and uh, these overheads only affect the data that is used in the in flash computation now uh, before i jump to evaluation if you have any questions uh, please uh, let me know okay uh, let's move to the evaluation uh, so we perform two types of evaluation for flash cosmos one is a real device characterization um, and the other one is a system level evaluation so for real device characterization what we do is we validate the feasibility and uh, reliability of flash cosmos on 160 real 3d nand flash chips and we test around uh, more than 3 million word lines and these uh, these char this characterization is done using worst case operating conditions where we have, where the flash cells undergo one year retention time at uh, 10000 pe cycles and also the data patterns that are used are uh, the worst case patterns. Now the system level evaluation is to, um, to evaluate the performance and energy efficiency of flash cosmos. And that is done using a uh, state of the art SSD simulator, which is MQSIM. And we have discussed MQSIM in the last lecture. So uh, we use three real uh, world applications, bitmap indices, which perform uh, performs bitwise and of up to thousand operands. Image segmentation performs bitwise hand of just three operands, but these operands are quite large in size, um, up to 45 gigabytes uh, for each operand. And cake leak star listing is uh, performs bit, both bitwise and and or of up to 32 operands. Now we have also Im uh, implemented uh, some of the baselines in the simulator, which is one, one of them is the outside storage processing system, which is which models a multi-core CPU. Um, an in-storage processing system, which uh, which has an in-storage hardware accelerator, and uh, Parabit, which is the state-of-the-art in flash processing mechanism. Now, uh, I'll briefly discuss the results of real device characterization. So, um, this is just a summary. So, both intra and interblock MWS operations require no changes to the cell cell array and of the commodity and flash chips. And both these operations can activate multiple word lines. And in, in case of intra, you can do it up to 48 word lines. And in inter block, inter MWS, you can do up to four word lines across different blocks. And you can do it at the same time. And the sensing latency only increases by around 10%. And ESP uh, significantly improves the reliability of computation results, which means that we have not observed any bit errors in the tested flash cells. Now, moving on to the system level evaluation, uh, we show the performance and energy of uh, different uh, prior approaches uh, with uh, Flash Cosmos. So we show the speed up 
uh, the performance in terms of speed up over uh, outside storage processing and the energy benefit uh, over outside storage processing we um, we show the is we show the results for isp parabit and flash cosmos and uh, here the the higher the uh, result the, it is better so uh, we we see that uh, flash cosmos provides significant performance and energy benefits over all the baselines and uh, these benefits only increase when we have more operands and we can do simultaneous sensing and this results in higher performance and energy benefits so we have a lot more uh, analysis and results in the paper um, as i mentioned we show this uh, support for other types of bitwise operations um, detailed uh, characterization results uh, optimizations to improve the performance of bitwise operations and um, the command interface that we introduced for flash cosmos uh, system support and uh, detailed overhead analysis so i would encourage everyone to go through the paper so in summary uh, flash cosmos is the first work that enables in flash multi operand bulk bitwise operations with a single sensing operation and uh, at high reliability significantly improves performance and energy efficiency over uh, prior approaches and these benefits come at a low cost and require no changes to uh, sell uh, flash cells in commodity flash chips so with this uh, we'll conclude the first paper uh, in this uh, present in the in this lecture if you have any questions uh, yeah, i'll be happy to discuss any comments or idea on top of this work? Uh, if I remember correctly, when uh, we write uh, some data in uh, SSD, we do a randomization of the bits. So there's still a randomization when we do you use the Flash Cosmos or not, because if you use a randomization, the result could be different than expected. Uh, that's, an, that's a very good question. So. We don't perform randomization um, when we are uh, doing bulk bitwise operations or when we store using Flash Cosmos because uh, randomization typically happens in the SSD controller, which is away from the Flash chips. So when we have to uh, perform randomization, the data has to go through the SSD controller and then move back to the Flash chips. So that, that results in additional data movement and uh, it uh, eats up into the benefits of Flash Cosmos. So the ESP technique that we propose uh, provides uh, as much reliability as uh, um, the randomization and the ECC um, uh, techniques that we have in, um, in our regular flash devices. I think I have a question. So how does this uh, ESP compare to normal SLC programming? And why not vendors using it, basically? Yeah, so the, so that's a good question. So ESP is, uh, as we said, uh, as I said, the while we are in increasing the reliability margin, we also incur an additional uh, uh, latency overhead in terms of the program. And uh, yeah, so this, this additional latency is something that the manufacturers have to uh, uh, accommodate in their uh, designs but yeah so this is uh, this is something that uh, uh, i mean in in terms of when we look at uh, high end uh, ssds we may not be able to uh, afford in such uh, devices but uh, yeah this this should this can be uh, helpful in increasing the reliability in even commodity ssds thank you and uh... So it's true that ESP provides better reliability, um, at least for short short term. But does it have, uh, let's say, long term endurance impact on on flash memory? Basically, does it uh, affect the, the number of program arrays that we can tolerate? Okay. I that's something which we have not uh, really uh, verified. Uh, by increasing the threshold voltage to higher levels, 
we may actually degrade the uh, flash cells. Um, I'm not sure if we do it significantly, but there may, there will be an impact. So uh, yeah, with that, uh, I mean, there may be some impact on the lifetime, but uh, without the ECC and randomization techniques, I think, uh, yeah, this is what we can uh, try to improve uh, the reliability, what we can do for you know, reliability. Any other questions, thoughts? Okay, I think we can move on to the next. You see the so. so uh so the next work that i will discuss in uh, the like in today's lecture is uh, is called venice which is improving uh, solid state drive parallelism at low cost via conflict free accesses and this work was published uh, at iska 2023 so uh so now we'll uh, we'll briefly look at the motivation for this work and then look at the uh, the key ideas of Venice and the evaluation. So I'll start with a overview of a modern solid state drive and um, a typical SSD that uh, that you purchase. A commodity SSD has a uh, compute unit within the SSD, as we saw in the previous uh, presentation. It's called an SSD controller, and it has many uh, components in it. Uh, we have a host interface layer to uh, interface with the host through the PCIe or NVMe protocol. And then there is uh, a flash translation layer, which performs many functionalities like address translation, uh, garbage collection, where leveling, and so on. And we also have a DRAM within the SSD, which, uh, which is used to uh, store part of the uh, address mapping table and also the, uh, the frequently accessed data. And then we have a bunch of flash controllers, which uh, which are uh, responsible for sending command sequence sequences to the flash chips and also sending the data to the uh, through the flash channels so these flash chips are connected to the flash controller through a shared channel so we have a number of flash chips which can range from 4 to 32 flash chips which uh, that that are connected to a, through a single shared channel and this uh, the ssds are mostly multi channel shared bus architecture uh, devices so now let's look at what what uh, what is the key problem that uh, that we see when there are these shared channels and shared resources in the SSDs. So uh, multiple flash memory chips are connected to the SSD controller using a shared channel. And when in data intensive applications, when IO requests attempt to simultaneously access the flash chips that use a single shared channel, we ex uh, they experience path conflict. So path conflicts cause IO requests to be transferred serially on the shared channel when they simultaneously access, try to access. And this limits the SSD parallelism and reduces the performance. Now let's look at path conflicts with, uh, with an interesting case study. So uh, here we look at uh, a case where there is there are, um, there are requests are coming to two different flash chips within the same channel. And these, uh, read requests cannot uh, go through the flash channel at the same time and they experience path conflict. So if we look at the timeline of how these read, two read requests are processed, and here we uh, show that uh, for a single channel, the two flash chips, read, read operation typically has multiple steps like command transfer, the actual read operation in the flash chips and the data transfer. So the command transfer uh, cannot happen serially the read operation is uh, delayed, and the data transfer is performed uh, in uh, is also performed serially. This is because the channel is uh, is shared, and uh, the data cannot be sent for both the flash chips, both the read requests. Sorry. 
So this, uh, the command transfer and the data transfer are served serially. Now we look at another case where uh, two read requests um, target two different flash chips, uh, which are connected to different channels, and they can be served in parallel. And if you look at the timeline of these two requests, we see that the command transfer, the read operation, and the data transfer actually happen in, par uh, in parallel. And uh, this actually saves a lot of cycle when, cycles when we look at the, the uh, first case. So with this, uh, so path conflicts increase the average IO latency by 57% in, in our experiments on a performance optimized SSD. And uh, the performance overhead of path conflicts increases by 1.6 times uh, when we uh, look at high intensity IO intensity workloads. So with this uh, problem, uh, what we try to see is uh, see next is the prior approaches and how they try to mitigate the uh, path conflict uh, problem. So we have the baseline SSD, which is uh, typical multi-channel shared bus architecture. And uh, we have packetized SSD, a prior work, which increases the channel bandwidth by two times so that uh, more data can be sent through the channel at the same, at the same uh, time. But these, uh, these two techniques don't uh, necessarily provide path diversity to the flash chips. So they st still offer a, offer a shared path and uh, they don't offer part diversity. Now, there is another work which is packetized network SSD, which, uh, which was also published in Micro 2022. And they, uh, in this work, uh, they introduce uh, vertical channels along with horizontal channels. So you can see these vertical channels uh, along with the regular horizontal channels. And there is also the network on SSD uh, work called NOSSD, which is, uh, which, uh, which proposes an interconnection network of flash chips. Uh, and each flash chip is connected using a link. Uh, so th these works, uh, although they offer part diversity, they do not effectively utilize the part diversity and they incur large area and cost overheads. So the, our goal is to fundamentally address the path conflict problem in SSDs by increasing the number of paths to each flash chip, which we call part diversity, and we should do it at low cost and effectively utilizing the increased part diversity for communication between the SSD controller and the flash chips. Now, uh, we look at, with this motivation, we look at Venice, and uh, our proposal is called Venice, which, is, uh, which has three key aspects. Uh, Venice uh, has a low, a low cost interconnection network of flash chips in the SSD. Uh, it offers a conflict-free path reservation for each IO request. And it uses a non-minimal fully adaptive routing algorithm for path identification. Now let's look at each one in a bit more detail. So we'll start with the low cost interconnection network of flash chips. So Venice uh, also uses an interconnection network uh, of flash nodes in, uh, in this case. And we look at the design of a flash node and uh, each flash node is connected to, the, uh, to another flash node using bidirectional links. Now, when we look at the design of a flash node, it has a flash chip connected with, uh, and a router chip placed next to the flash chip. And these two uh, interact with each other using the traditional IO bus. So Venice provides increased part diversity at low cost because uh, we do not perform any modifications to existing flash chips in Venice. So the commodity flash chips do not have to undergo any changes in terms of additional pins or anything like that. Now we look at uh, conflict-free path reservation for each IO request. So, so Venice uses a small uh, scout packet to reserve a conflict-free path for each IO request. So here we show a network of uh, flash nodes. And uh, let's say we receive, an, receive a request uh, for target flash node F8. So what Venice does is it, it uh, sends a small scout packet through the network and uh, this scout packet uh, goes to each uh, flash node. And there, as I showed, there is a router inside the flash node. And that in, in that router, uh, there is a router reservation table where the scout packet adds an entry into the, the router adds an entry into the router reservation table, indicating which packet, what is the packet ID, the entry port, exit port, and the valid bit. So the scout packet then, once the entry is added to the router reservation table, it 
the the link is reserved for this code packet. So so the code packet continues to um, traverse the network till it fi it finds the destination uh, target node, and uh, along the way it, it also reserves the path. So once the Scout packet reaches the destination node, it returns to the flash controller to indicate the completion of the path reservation process. And this path is reserved for conflict-free IO transfer uh, henceforth. So uh, now we look at another example where we have we already have a path reserved uh, for uh, this IO request. Now we also receive another uh, request uh, for which is targeted uh, for F9, and uh, we cannot use this path because there is already a uh, path reservation uh, that has been done. So what Venice does is it uh, tries to send a scout packet through the um, through another uh, flash controller, uh, and that it tra traverses through the network and finds a path uh, to the destination target node. And it returns, and then uh, this path is also reserved for that flash control for the IO request. So in this way, uh, path reservation eliminates path conflicts by enabling uh, conflict-free IO transfer. And uh, since the scout packet is a very small packet, the overhead of path reservation is negligible uh, due to the small size of the scout packet. Then we look at a non-minimal fully adaptive routing algorithm for path identification. Uh, so Venice uses a non-minimal fully adaptive routing algorithm to route scout packets when a minimal path is not available. So what we saw here is uh, in the previous example is basically a minimal path where uh, the scout, uh, scout packet is sent from the nearest flash controller. So this effectively utilizes the, the, the routing algorithm, effectively utilizes the idle links in the interconnection network to find a conflict-free path. So now look, let, we also show another uh, interconnection network here. And there is uh, there are requests coming into the network and uh, there is a request to F8, which uses this path shown in red. Uh, a request to F6, F6, which is shown in orange. And a request to F7, which is shown in green. Now, uh, the tar these are reserved minimal paths because uh, they take the shortest path to the destination. Now, with these reserved paths, we, we also get a request to F2. And uh, there is no way we can reach these, uh, reach the target flash node using a minimal path because all the other uh, paths are occupied. Now, what uh, Venice does is it finds a um, longer path using its non-minimal fully adaptive routing algorithm. And then uh, doing, while doing this, it also utilizes the idle links and then reserves this non-minimal path for the IO request. Compared to the traditional system, if there was, if all these paths were already uh, occupied, this request would have to wait uh, till one of the paths have, uh, is freed up. So with this, we uh, try to reduce the queuing latency and also um, find a conflict-free path using the idle links. So, we have discussed the three key aspects of uh, Venice, but there are a lot more uh, details in terms of the design and the mechanism, such as handling deadlock and livelock scenarios, the overhead of uh, using a non-minimal path, and uh, a more detailed background on prior approaches and the SSD architecture. So I'll jump into evaluation, but if you have any questions on the design, um, yeah, I'll be happy to take it now. Okay, I'll move on with the evaluation. So we evaluate uh, MQSIM, uh, we evaluate Venice and prior approaches using MQSIM, a state-of-the-art SSD simulator. Uh, we have we use two SSD configurations, a performance-optimized configuration, which is based on Samsung ZNAND SSD, and a cost-optimized configuration based on Samsung TLC NAND. And we use 19 data-intensive workloads from uh, a variety of uh, um, sources, uh, these are traditionally block IO, uh, block uh, workloads, storage workloads. And uh, we implement a bunch of prior approaches that we just discussed, a baseline SSD, packetized SSD, PA, packetized network SSD, and NO SSD. 
And we also implement a path conflict free SST, which is an ideal SST that doesn't exist. Uh, but this SST, SST doesn't experience any path conflicts because each flash chip in the in the network is or in the flash arrays has a dedicated channel to the flash controller. So there are uh, there are as many flash controllers as uh, flash chips. So with this, uh, we'll move to the results. And uh, I'll start with the performance analysis. So on a performance optimized SSD, we show the speed up uh, of all these approaches over uh, baseline SSD. And uh, you can see Venice in uh, green and uh, uh, the path conflict free SSD in blue here. So the higher the value, it's better. Uh, so Venice uh, improves the SSD performance by up to by 1.9 times on average over the best performing prior approach. Uh, and uh, Venice's performance is within 45% of the performance of a path conflict free SSD. Now, we'll, uh, we also have results on the cost optimized SSD, which uh, where we should again show the speed up over baseline SSD for all these policies. And uh, again, higher is better. So here uh, in cost optimized SSD, the performance improvement is, is 1.5 times on average over the best performing prior approach. And the performance is, Venice's performance is within 25% of the performance of a path conflict free SSD. So, uh, so Venice provides significant improvement in performance over all prior approaches. Now uh, we look at the reduction in path conflicts. We, um, we show the percentage of IO requests uh, that experience path conflicts in across all these policies in uh, different workloads. And uh, on the y-axis, we show the percentage. And uh, so here, the lower is better. So, so as you can see, the uh, when it's shown in green, is, is very, uh, has very few path conflicts. And it's, less, it's around 0.02%. So 99.98% of the IO requests do not experience path conflicts. Uh, so uh, you may think, why why are we still experiencing some path conflicts? But in this experiment, what we also may, uh, uh, take into account is if all the four uh, flash, if let's say we have four flash controllers and all of them are trying to reserve a path, then a new request comes, then that request cannot be serviced immediately. So we consider that as path conflict as well. So Venice mitigates path conflicts by using uh, path reservation and uh, also effectively utilizes the path diversity. Now we'll uh, look at energy consumption. So because Venice is uh, reducing the queuing delays for the IO requests, we also see benefits in terms of energy consumption. So uh, we show the energy consumption normalized to baseline SSD and uh, for all these approaches. And uh, here, uh, the lower is better. So when it's shown in green, reduces the energy consumption by 46% on average over the most efficient prior work and by 61% over the baseline SSD. So we have more results in the paper. Um, I'll skip them uh, for now. Uh, so uh, we have power and overhead and area overhead analysis, tail latency analysis, and sensitivity to different configurations uh, of interconnection networks, and also performance on mixed workloads. So I'll again refer you to the paper for uh, knowing more about Venice and uh, the mechanism and the evaluation. So in summary, Venice, is, uh, Venice mitigates path conflicts by efficiently uh, utilizing the path diversity of the SSD interconnection network. It uh, significantly improves the performance uh, or the best performing prior approach on two configurations. And it reduces energy consumption by 46% on average or the most efficient prior work. And the, these benefits come at a low cost. And uh, again, we don't, we don't make any changes to the commodity flash chips. So that's, that's the end of uh, Venice. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, yeah, please um, feel free to ask. So maybe I will 
ask a question. Hopefully, other people will also ask some questions. Um, so, can can Venice be applied on other topology? <laughs> Uh, and just to let you know that Mohammed is is the primary author of this paper as well. <laughs> so uh, I'm asking questions to initiate some discussion. Basically. Yes. Uh, so Venice doesn't have any restrictions uh, when implemented on uh, other topologies, but uh, we need to also look at uh, the constraints that other topologies offer uh, offers and uh, and basically. Uh, Venice can adaptively uh, find a conflict-free path even in those topologies. Uh, but we haven't uh, really tried those uh, topologies in um, in this work, but that's something which we can take up in a future work. Yes. Could you improve uh, performance even more by adding more flash controllers like uh, at other points in the, the network? And, uh, is it much better than just adding more controllers in a normal architecture? Yes, that's a, that's a really good question. So, uh, so there, are, uh, there is some research going on on uh, adding flash controllers at, uh, in different, uh, let's say, uh, areas of the of the flash uh, array or in the interconnection network and adding more flash controllers while it comes with a cost of uh, area and uh, power consumption uh, but it significantly improves the uh, the request handling capability so uh, i agree that we can improve the performance but it's a trade off of uh, on the overhead and also the performance benefit that we get Connecting to this question without just adding new controllers, what if we put like uh, two controllers on the left, uh, two controllers on the right? Could that help? Yes, I think. Uh, I mean, we can look at. Uh, I think that's more or less what we look, what we see when we uh, look at other topologies. We can. Uh, we have flash controllers or uh, the flash chips connected in different ways and. Adding flash controllers uh, to the left and to the right or on the top can also help in uh, basically reducing the traversal time for command and data. So that can reduce the latency and improve the performance. Any other questions? Yes, more questions. Um, so does this make sense or does it already exist outside of the context of SSDs? So this scouting-based um, network routing. So I'm thinking perhaps on the GPU, communicating between cores and cache. Does it already exist or if not, why not? Mohamed is a better person to answer this question. So it actually exists. Um, what we call here as scouting is very similar to circuit switching uh, that we usually, um, I mean, this is a, a one switching technique that we have in interconnection network. So basically, whenever a source wants to send the data or message to destination, uh, source will send a header or scout, let's say, packet to the destination and reserve the pass. And then we have a, a circuit uh, established from the source to the destination. And then the source will basically put data on it. So there are some uh, real actually chips and design that they use circuit switching. It's uh, very useful for the mm, for some traffic pattern that you know whenever we are establishing a connection from source to the destination, then we want to send a lot of data. Sometimes for streaming accesses, for example. So yeah, that's it, I guess. Any other questions?
So the last work in uh, in this part of the lecture, which uh, with the focus on storage systems, is called Sybil. So uh, so we looked at in flash processing, which is the which is at the the lowest end of the uh, the flash storage. Then we moved to the SSD controller and uh, flash controllers, and now we even move further higher up to uh, look at uh, storage uh, devices, multiple storage devices. And uh, this work called Sybil, which is uh, adaptive and extensible data placement in hybrid storage systems, uh, uses online reinforcement learning. Uh, and this work uh, was published at ISCA 2022. So I'll, I'll start with an executive summary. So, so the background is that, uh, yeah, with uh, multiple storage, with uh, storage devices, high-end storage devices, what we get is limited capacity. And with uh, uh, devices which have more capacity, the performance is, uh, takes a hit. So what a hybrid storage system does is it combines multiple storage devices to provide high-end scalable storage capacity at high performance. Uh, so the problem with uh, some of the prior data placement policies is they lack the adaptivity to changes in workload and changes to in device types and configurations. And they also lack extensibility to more devices. We'll look at all these uh, things in a bit more detail uh, soon. So the goal of this work is to design a, design a data placement technique that provides adaptivity by continuously learning and adapting to the application changes and the underlying device characteristics. And also provides uh, it should provide easy extensibility to incorporate a wide range of hybrid storage configurations. So the contribution of this work is uh, it, it is the first reinforcement based a learning based uh, data placement technique in hybrid storage systems and it provides adaptivity to changes in workload, uh, underlying device characteristics, uh, and it can e easily be extended to multiple storage devices in the system. And it can also uh, provide ease of design and implementation and it requires uh, a small computation overhead. So if you look at the results of uh, Sybil, we uh, evaluate uh, Sybil on a real system with a wide range of workloads. And Sybil improves the performance by 21.6% compared to the best performing uh, data placement, uh, prior data placement technique on a dual HSS configuration where there are two devices. And on a tri-hybrid uh, storage system, Sybil uh, outperforms the state-of-the-art policy by 48.2%. And uh, Sybil also achieves 80% of the performance of an Oracle policy with a storage overhead of only one, 125 kilobytes. So Sybil is, uh, is open source and uh, you can all take a look and uh, uh, play around with the code. So I'll, I'll start with uh, discussing the key shortcomings of uh, prior data placement techniques. Uh, so. I'll start with a brief introduction on what is a hybrid storage system. So uh, here we see a very high-end device, uh, which is Intel Optane and a low-end device, which is a hard drive. And when you combine uh, the hybrid storage system combines these two devices and offers a unified uh, logical address space, uh, which is a uh, sum total of the uh, address space of both these devices. And uh, the storage management uh, layer is, is the one which uh, provides this unified logical address space. And it also orchestrates the, the read and writes, reads and writes that, uh, that the application um, uh, tries to do. And uh, it also decides where the reads and writes have to be done, uh, where the data has to be placed and read from and so on. So uh, you can see the application, uh, the logical place uh, pages are being uh, read and written to in, in the hybrid storage system. And uh, with all this, we also have to move the data between the two devices. And this is uh, the movement, data movement from the slow device to the fast device is called promotion. And from the fast device to the slow device is called eviction. So the, the critical aspect of this, of a hybrid storage system is its performance is highly dependent on the ability of the storage management layer to effectively utilize the fast device because that offers the lower latency and that can improve the performance of the system. 
So uh, we observe two key shortcomings that significantly limit the performance benefits of prior techniques. The first one is lack of adaptivity to workload changes and uh, changes in device types and configuration. And the other shortcoming is the lack of extensibility to more devices. So uh, here, when we design a policy, a data placement policy for two devices, they, that policy will not work for three devices or four devices, or when you remove a device from the system. So that, that is extensibility. So we show some results to uh, demonstrate the lack of adaptivity to workload changes. So here we show the normalized average request latency, which is the which is the average request latency normalized to fast only device where uh, fast only means that the entire data set or the workload can fit into the fast device only and uh, here we sh uh, the lower the value it is better so we show the results for cde which is a heuristic policy which uh, uses fixed thresholds to perform the data placement and uh, data placement then we also have a supervised learning based approach which is which uses recurrent neural networks to uh, train models and predict the access patterns so that is called rn and hss and there is also an oracle approach which uh, which has knowledge of future access patterns that's a, that's kind of an ideal uh, device uh, and it performs data placement based on that knowledge so here we see when we look at the performance of cde uh, versus Oracle, we see that uh, the performance uh, is basically very, there is a large gap between uh, the performance of, a, of an Oracle and uh, um, and uh, the CDE policy in some of these workloads, PRN1 and uh, uh, let's say user zero. And in cases, in, in other workloads like HM1 and WDEV2, we see the gap is limited, is minimal. So this shows that the the policy doesn't perform as well uh, or perform well across all the workloads so next we uh, look at uh, the changes in device types and configuration so um, these policies do not consider the underlying storage device characteristics such as the read and write latency of these devices and uh, garbage collection uh, so and so on so we, here we show the results again, uh, average request latency normalized to fast only device. And uh, we show the results on one of the HSS configurations. So we show the results for slow only, CDE, RNN, HSS, and Oracle. And again, lower the better here. So we see that CD, uh, CDE performs worse than putting all the data in a slow only device, which means that uh, we have a slow device and we can play, we can just place all the data there, but CD performs worse than that policy. And this is because CD actually tries to perform a lot of data migrations in terms of promotions and evictions. And that adds into the, into the IO request latency. Now we again look at another workload where we see a similar trend, but when we, uh, run these policies on a different HSS configuration, we see that CD performs much better than slow only device. So you can see it on uh, most of these workloads. So this means that these policies do not re necessarily adapt to the changes in the device conditions and, uh, and the characteristics. So, so this shows that the, there is a lack of adapt adaptability to changes in workload and uh, device conditions. Now there is also lack, lack of extensibility. So these techniques are very rigid that require significant effort to accommodate more than two devices. So we let's say the policy has been designed for a dual HSS, but when we add another uh, device, uh, which, is tri which becomes a tri-hybrid storage system, we have to design a new policy because they are all based on thresholds, uh, fixed thresholds and heuristics. So, our goal is to uh, to design a data placement mechanism that can provide adaptivity to by by continuously learning and adapting to uh, the application and and uh, underlying device characteristics and easy extensibility to a number of uh, devices in the hybrid storage con in system so to this end we propose sibyl and uh, which formulates data placement as a reinforcement learning problem so let's look at how we uh, 
solve data placement using uh, reinforcement learning. So some basics on uh, RL or reinforcement learning. So uh, RL has a, uh, there is an agent and an environment. So the agent gets uh, its state information from the environment and performs an action which affects the environment. And the environment also provides a reward for the action that the agent took uh, in the next uh, time step. So the agent uh, in reinforcement learning learns to take an action uh, in a given state to maximize the reward that it gets from the system. Now, how do we formulate data placement as an RL uh, technique? So we look at uh, Sybil as the agent and the hybrid storage system as the environment. And uh, the, env the system also provides or Sybil captures uh, features from the current request and also the system. And uh, it selects uh, a storage device to place the current page. And that is the action that, uh, that is performed by Sybil. And the reward that it, the, the agent gets or Sybil gets is, in, is a function of the request latency of the last served request. So let's look at uh, what is the state. Uh, so in Sybil, we have a limited number of state features, because, mainly because to, uh, we want to reduce the implementation overhead. And also uh, RL agent we observe is more sensitive to the reward structure. And we have a six dimensional vector of state features for every request that comes into the system. So it, it uh, cap we capture the size, the type of the request, the uh, access interval, the access count, the capacity of the fast device or the slow device, and uh, where the current request, the, where the page is already placed for the current request. And uh, we quantize the state representation into multiple bins uh, in order to reduce the uh, storage overhead. Now, what is the reward? Reward is uh, the thing which defines the objective of the of Sybil. And we formulate the reward as a function of request latency. And this is because it encapsulates three key aspects because reward also uh, captures the internal state of the device. So if there is garbage collection going on or if there are queuing delays, then we see a higher request latency. And also the throughput. And if there are evictions being performed in the background um, or in the foreground uh, to make space in a, in a in the fast device, then it also gets captured in the latency itself. So we have a lot more details on other reward structures that we used in the that we tried to use in the paper. Um, so now let's look at the action. So the action is uh, very simple. So for every new re page request, the action is to select a storage device. And this action can be extended to any number of storage devices. And uh, Sybil also evicts a page from the fast device to the slow device if, if the fast device capacity is, is completely utilized. Now we'll uh, briefly look at the design of the RL agent in, uh, in Sybil. So the, in Sybil, we have uh, two threads, a decision thread which, uh, which takes the storage request from the operating system and then performs the data placement decision. And there is a training thread which, uh, which captures the state reward and the inf action information from the decision thread, and then performs the training uh, using uh, deep neural networks, and then uh, basically transfers the weights of those uh, neural networks to the decision thread frequently so that we can adapt to different uh, uh, ch the changes in the system. So this uh, asynchronous execution model works well because uh, that we have just the decision thread in the critical path of the data placement, and uh, this has very low overhead. So now we look at the an enlarged view of this uh, uh, of the agent, and again we see two uh, basically two threads running: uh, a training thread and a decision thread. So we look at the decision thread, the, we get a storage request from the operating system. It is captured in the observation vector where we capture those individual uh, characteristics such as the type of the request, the uh, access count, access freak, uh, interval and so on. And that state information is fed to the inference network in the decision thread where um, the uh, objective is to maximize the policy of Sybil. 
and while doing that we also shared the state information with uh, and basically once this neural network provides an inference uh, which is an action uh, it is being uh, the page is being placed in the hybrid storage system and we also share a reward provide a reward to the agent and the the state action and reward are being collected in uh, are being used as experiences and they are collected in an experience buffer which is uh, typically stored in the host dram so this is yeah basically what i just explained so from the experience buffer we uh, sample uh, some experiences and then uh, use that as the training data set for the training network which actually has a, has the same uh, neural network design as the decision thread and once the training network uh is uh, basically trains uh, is trained it performs a periodic policy wait update and we we wait for the convergence of the training network and then uh, the policy up, wait update is happening frequently let's say 1000 requests once and that enables uh, the inference network to keep track of the changes and also capture the uh, changes in the system so that's more that's the overview of uh, the design uh, of the rl agent now I'll, i'll quickly move to the evaluation and uh, we evaluate sibyl using a real system with uh, uh, two hybrid uh, or multiple storage co hss configurations a dual hybrid system and a tri hybrid system so this is a system that we used for our uh, evaluation so you see you can see uh, multiple devices starting from the high end device to the low end device here and all this inference and training happens on the cpu uh, in the system so we form a cost oriented hss configuration by combining the two devices which is intel optane and uh, the hard drive and a performance oriented hss configuration using the high end device and the middle end device which is another ssd with uh, higher latency characteristics so we choose 18 different workloads from a uh, variety of sources uh, we implement four state of the art data placement baselines cde and hps are uh, two heuristic based approaches and uh, archivist and uh, rnn hss are uh, supervised learning based approaches so we look at the results uh, now and uh, we start with cost oriented hss configuration where we show the average request latency again normalized to fast only here the lower the value it's better and you can see that uh, sibyl is able to consistently outperform all the baselines for all the workloads uh, and uh, when we look at performance oriented configuration um, again sibyl provides up to 21 points provides 21.6% uh, performance improvement on average and it dynamically adapts to the adapted data placement policy now there are uh, a couple of cases where sibyl doesn't really perform so well compared to some of the prior approaches uh, in the performance oriented configuration and we provide some insights in, in the paper on why this happens and we attribute mostly uh, because of the the experience buffer capacity and also the the nature of the workload which is purely random in these two cases so uh, with that sibyl achieves 80% of the performance of an oracle policy uh, so now we uh, also evaluate sibyl on a tri hybrid storage system uh, it took a lot of effort to come up with a baseline because all these baselines are designed for two um, two devices in the system and we had to uh, implement extend one of the baselines so extending sibyl for multiple devices is very easy because we we just have to add an action into the neural network which which means that we need to add another output node in the output layer of the neural network and also add the remaining capacity of the new device as one of the state features that we train our net um, uh, the inference and the training thread on so here we implemented uh, we implement a heuristic based uh, tri hybrid system and uh, we see that sibyl consistently outperforms uh, 
on all the workloads. So Sybil is able to provide 48.2% uh, performance improvement on a real tri-hybrid system. And uh, as, as I discussed, so Sybil is able to reduce the architect's burden by providing ease of extensibility. Now we look at uh, the overhead of Sybil. So the storage overhead is basically around one, 125 kilobytes. And this includes the experience buffer uh, storage and the inference and the training network uh, storage. Uh, and each uh, state it takes around 40 bits. Uh, that is the metadata that we capture, that we store for each state. And uh, this captures all the state features. So the inference latency is, is around 10 nanoseconds, which is uh, significantly lower than the, the high-end SSD's read latency. And the training latency is around 2 microseconds. So it comes with a small area overhead, small inference overhead, and it also uh, satisfies the prediction latency. So there are a bunch of results that I am not able to discuss because of time constraint, throughput uh, evaluation, unseen workload, mixed workloads, uh, and uh, evaluation on different features, different hyperparameter values. Hyperparameter is a very significant uh, uh, thing in uh, RL-based uh, approaches. And uh, also sensitivity to fast storage. And we also provide an exp explainability analysis in the paper, which tries to uh, decipher what Sybil is doing in terms of its actions. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, I would uh, refer you to the paper for all these details. Uh, the explainability an analysis very, is very interesting. So in conclusion, uh, so we introduced Sybil, which is the first RL-based data placement technique in hybrid storage systems that provides adaptivity to changes in workload and device conditions, extensibility, ease of design and implementation. And we evaluate Sybil on real systems with using many workloads, and it provides performance improvement of 21.6% compared to the best per, uh, prior uh, data placement policy on a dual uh, HSS configuration. On a tri-hybrid system, it outperforms the state-of-the-art uh, data placement policy by 48.2%. And, uh, and Sybil is able to achieve 80% of the performance of an Oracle policy with a storage overhead of 125 kilobytes. So uh, this is the GitHub link for uh, our open source code. Uh, please feel free to uh, look at that and provide your comments or um, if you have any questions. And that's the end of uh, Sybil. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to discuss. Yes, please. Is there any notion of fairness in uh, Sybil? Or uh, could, the, for example, a malicious program force all its pages to go to the fast storage? So, so it, it basically, uh, so what we, uh, that is something that we have also discussed in the explainability analysis. So what Sybil does is it it uh, understands the the latency differences between the two uh, devices, and uh, it it knows that if there is uh, if it if it tries to place a lot of data in the fast device, then it also causes evictions that need that uh, needs to be performed. So in uh, in some of the in the cost oriented configuration, it is able to understand that. Um, it should only place perf uh, very critical data in the fast device. So in terms of fairness, it, uh, it always tries to uh, optimize, uh, effectively utilize the fast device, but also not cause a lot of evictions to the slow device. So uh, yeah, that's the fairness policy it is currently having. Hi, I have a question about the overhead. You said the overhead is small, but I'm wondering uh, the over whether the overhead will increase with the uh, number of devices. Yes, uh, as, as I mentioned in the overhead uh, part, uh, let me go back there. So, 
So the 40 bit metadata actually increases when we, um, when we have uh, add additional devices be, because we want to also capture the capacity of those devices. So that actually uh, increases the overhead by uh, just metadata overhead. And also the, the inference and the training network uh, sizes also increase because we add an additional node in the output layer. But uh, while well, I say all this, uh, the, the network design is quite um, small and low, uh, lo low cost. So we have only like uh, uh, two uh, hidden layers and one uh, input layer and one output layer. So that, uh, that is the reason why we have a uh, reduced uh, inference latency. Any other questions? Okay, thanks a lot, Rakesh. Um, I think we can have a break until 2.45, and then we're gonna back with uh, Constantinus talk. Thank you. I also added some comments to your abstract. Uh, yeah, so we have to do it in the morning. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, I will add some um, introduction of model. Okay. I will do my best. We have time, okay? Uh, Tuesday, right? I mean, Tuesday, uh, our time. Tuesday noon is our time. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I will also spend some time. Uh, so, so, uh, so uh, in the directory based uh, cache coherence, yeah. so we said the uh, excuse for this, uh, but uh, in one of the slides, when we uh, slides on the presentation, uh, when uh, one sets or loads only read one. Uh, Cache line, yeah. the exclusive bit is not set. Yes. Why? Because uh, there is a difference that you want to read it right or you want only that. So sometimes processors they can say, oh, I have a, I want to read it and I want to use it to write it. So processor can request the exclusive. There are different commands. It could be single read, it could be exclusive. Uh, setting that uh, bit uh, includes something. For example, I read first, and then maybe you action later. I want to write to it. Yeah, but you shouldn't. Uh, you know, it's easier to say that. Oh, I want to do some to reserve the servers, offline servers for you know for now. But I'm planning to run it in a day. It's very simple here. Yeah. So if you want, if you don't want to write to it immediately, probably you shouldn't do it. And then about the topology. Uh, why? Uh, I don't understand exactly uh, what the blocking means. Because for example, in the two D mesh, uh, I have uh, an adaptive routing. I could uh, find the new way. Not all. There could be, I mean, it's actually very good. Not all. So, to the mesh, including uh, non block, I mean, like non minimal routing, non minimal fee adaptive routing. On average, I will, uh, like, you should be able to establish many different parameters. 
but a definition of blocking or non blocking is actually very different. So there, you can actually prove that this topology is not non blocking. There are some weird cases that you can come up and say, oh, now I can So as far as I know, this is not considered as non blocking. But yeah, as I said, these are some theoretical concepts from graph But in reality, most of the dimensions. And then if we will also premiere some lectures after basically the water is still less because we should so after the lecture, we have a seminar. That's why we use. We will go to the that room to. I don't know. I guess we'll start the seminar, and then we can discuss about it. Because I mean, your the figures that I'm sharing with you. Because yeah, they're not. Yeah, no, I, I know they're not good. But uh, before doing something good, uh, I wanted to know how to present it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, overall, uh, so I need to understand it better. But at the same time, it would be good if you also check uh, John's paper. He has done similar to describe uh, for all the applications. So it's. Yeah, but look how the, the, yeah, in the sense of like. Uh, if I have a single graph, I know how to do it, but I have a single graph. Yeah, yes, for plots or for change over time. I mean, yeah, yeah let's discuss it. Uh, I should, uh, basically, I need to understand much better what you are, yeah. what you need, and then I will. Yeah. So, the problem, the, the main problem I saw with the abstract was that. Uh, it, it was written on uh, So when you're writing a paper, you're reading most So saying that, oh, we, we implement triangle something in Open is not something that we stress. So you need to um, make the case that it wasn't easy to so there were some challenges and how how you overcome these challenges by your idea of key mechanisms that you need to support. So for example, it wasn't obvious how to distribute data nicely across often codes and suggest long. So these are the things that you need to focus on. That, that's the main difference in here. The way that we report to people what they think yeah. and what they need. Um, yeah. And on paper. So on paper, you should also have to use it as a website. You need to send it by send it. So basically, uh, don't wait for my comments to the introduction. I think introduction has yeah. to be the issue. Similar to abstract. I will check, but I can't expect. So, I mean, it would be good if you can actually address this read, not my comments from the paper or something. It's my work. There are a lot of things that I know. I know. But actually, next time, uh, we should, uh, I mean, hopefully, you will join our group also. But yeah, uh, writing is an extremely important task. Paper and you usually need to start early and then you need to read them. So basically, if I if I had joined this project early, and for either hopefully for the next paper or for this paper also, we can present that. I mean, once you submit your work, please pass. Better to not actually stop this project. Basically, you need to keep working and improve your um, craft. But here, yes, I mean, the work may be accepted to this project, or may not be. If it's accepted, then you have a better version. You can read it. If the paper uh, gets rejected, then we have a better version. So it makes sense to continue. 
because uh, I think you're writing with a lot of quotations. This is understandable because it's your first time, but can you maintain the Also, there is that the fact that this is a bit fed up working on this. A bit fed up working on this. Yeah, so the fact that the results are not great. Results are not great. Makes me not want to work as much as English. I see. That's fine. That's fine. I mean, we can discuss also after the submission. It makes sense to continue this time. But will you apply to this then? Did you find the yeah, yeah, I found it. I didn't apply it. Okay. Yeah, feel free to sample yeah. uh, well, Maybe the schedule. Some of this.
Hi everyone. So we continue with the with the second part today for today's lecture. So I'm gonna discuss two works which were recently presented in Micro 2023. They're related to virtual memory. And then uh, I'm going to talk to you about an ongoing work, a uh, simulation framework we're trying to build up to enable these sort of works on the virtual memory topic. So let's start with Utopia. Uh, fast and efficient address translation via hybrid restrictive and flexible virtual to physical address mapping. Again, this was presented in Micro 2023. And as you can see, it's the like collaboration between multiple um, universities and industry. Let's see the executive summary first. So what's the problem? The problem is that conventional virtual memory frameworks enable a virtual address to flexibly map to any physical address. And what's the issue with that? That this flexibility necessitates large data structures, translation structures, which lead to high address translation latency to access and look up the data structures, the page table. We pay lots of uh, cycles. And second, we induce translation-based interference in the memory hierarchy. So actual data compete with page table data inside the memory hierarchy. What's our motivation behind this work? So if we restrict the address mapping, then this leads to more compact translation structures. And this way you can reduce the overheads of address translation. However, what's the issue with that? If we do this across the entire memory, this has two major drawbacks. So first we limit the core virtual memory functionalities. For example, we cannot easily share data anymore because we don't have the guarantee that two uh, virtual addresses can map to the same physical address. Second, we might increase swapping activity in the presence of free physical memory. We cannot place the virtual pages wherever we want, which means that we might have free physical pages and we do not leverage them efficiently. What's the key idea behind this work? It's Utopia. It's a new hybrid virtual to physical address mapping scheme that allows both flexible and restrictive hash-based address mappings to harmoniously coexist in the system. So Utopia uses uh, ma and manages a physical memory using two pieces, two different types of physical memory segments. One, we have the restrictive segment. And how do we map a page uh, to the restrictive segment? Through a hash function. And this way we find out what's the physical location inside the memory segment. For example, if we do a modulo hashing to the page, then we can figure out quickly where it resides in the physical address space. This, leads to fast address translation. What's the problem? It limits the, the amount of virtual memory features you can support. So we come up with the flexible segments as well. How do we map the pages? Using the page table. And right now, this virtual page come up to any potential physical page, free physical page inside the flexible segment. For example, modern systems use an x86, in the x86-64, use a Radix-based page table to map virtual to physical address, addresses. As I will show you later, this leads to slow address translation but it's up with support to all existing virtual memory features. What are our key results? Uh, Utopia performs a state-of-the-art contiguity aware translation scheme by 13% and achieves 95% of the performance of an ideal perfect TLB scheme everything hits inside the L1 TLB. Utopia is open source, you can find the code under this GitHub link. This is the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to deliver an extended background, let's say, in virtual memory so that we're all on the same page and we understand what's going on. So virtual memory, as you know, is one of the cornerstones of most modern computing systems. Conventional virtual memory designs provide application transparent memory, manager, memory management. So the, the application doesn't need to do anything with respect to memory manager. The operating system is the one who handles the allocation of physical pages. Second, data sharing. If I have two processes, we need to share libraries, for example. The way uh, to do this, if we use pure bare metal physical addresses, is not possible because these processes do not communicate with each other. The operating system, hand the operating system handles this right now in our systems, and they can basically effectively share data between two processes. And the third process is isolation. So processes do not need to care about uh, overwriting data of another process. The OS virtualizes the memory and it uh, assigns physical memory to each process so that they don't collide, so we don't have conflicts. A core feature of the virtual uh, memory management is that the mapping 
between the virtual to physical pages is fully associative. And what does that mean? We have the virtual address space and the physical address space, and we split it in chunks, which are called pages. And one virtual page can map to any of the three physical pages in the physical address space. How do we map them, though? We need a mapping, which is stored in a data structure, which we call it a page table. And how do we retrieve this mapping? We need to perform the page table walk to retrieve the mapping. Basically, we probe, we look up the, this data structure to retrieve the virtual physical mapping. How is this process? How does this process look like in an example system, let's say in x86-64 ISA? So we have the virtual address here. We split the first 36 bits, uh, 36 bits into four chunks of nine bits. These are called, uh, let's say, page level four, three, two, one. And then we have a register, the CR3 register. The CR3 register points to the root of the tree. And because the page table in x86-64 is stored as a tree. We first load the first level using the nine bits in the CR3 register. We use the nine bits as an offset. And we iteratively do this process until we reach the leaf of the tree. When we reach the leaf of the tree, we do not perform another recursion. We directly find the physical frame number. So we form the physical address using the, phys the physical frame number and the page offset. In the case of using four kilobyte pages, the page offset is 12 bits. How many accesses did we do to probe the, the Radix table? One, two, three, four. So we need four sequential memory accesses during a page table walk in x86-64 systems, which, as I will show you later, causes high performance overheads. What does the how does the system support right now virtual memory? So when we want to send a memory request to the memory hierarchy, right, the processor needs to translate the virtual address to the corresponding physical one. So if we want to resolve other translation, we need to access the page table. But if we, every time we needed to do that, we performed four sequential memory accesses, it would cause really high performance overheads. That's why modern processors employ a specialized hardware unit called the memory management unit. And this way we can accelerate address translation. So this is the flow of address translation. The core ships the virtual address inside the memory management unit. And the memory management unit does some stuff and somehow loads the page table inside the hardware. And this way we find out the virtual physical address. So let's see right now, uh, how does the memory management unit uh, look like? First, we have a two level TLB hierarchy. Two TLBs at the L1 level, one for instructions, one for data. If we receive a memory request for data, we probe the L1 DTLB. If we receive a, a translation request for instructions, we probe the L1 instruction DLB. If we miss in any of these structures, we look up a unified L2 TLB, which stores translations for both instructions and data. And if we miss in the L2 unified TLB, we need to trigger the page table walker. So you can imagine the page table walker as some sort of FSM, finished state machine, or circuitry that sends and performs this iterative process of watching the page table, which I showed you before. We also, the page table walker, before uh, it accesses the memory hierarchy to fetch the page table entries, it uh, probes a, a hardware component called the page walk caches. The page walk caches essentially store intermediate levels of the page table so that the whole end-to-end -end page walk process uh, gets resolved faster. So uh, we received the page table entry from the page table. And right now, we need to figure out where is our data inside the physical address space. A simple scenario, our data resides in the DRAM. Everything is OK. We send it back to the, to the CAS hierarchy. The bad scenario, the physical address resides in the swap space. And uh, you may know that from the Linux that there is, you need to define, in some cases, the swap space so that you don't destroy performance. Um, and in this scenario, you first need to swap the data inside DRAM and then send back the translation. So what is the translation latency in this scenario? In several scenarios, basically. First, we hit in the TLBs. If we hit in the TLBs, the translation latency is low. Why? Because the memory management does not need to communicate with the memory hierarchy. Second scenario, we need to load the page table. So we have a TLB miss in this scenario. And to retrieve the page table, we need to perform a cache or a DRAM access. 
So end to end, we will pay both for the TLB miss and the cast DRAM access, which constitutes in total the translation latency. And finally, after all this latency, we receive the physical address inside the core and we can perform the CAS access, the, the access to the memory hierarchy, the normal data access. Let's talk now about the translation overheads and how all these process that I showed you, how this corresponds to performance. So we have lots of data intensive workloads right now in the wild, generative AI, sparse attention models. We have graph analytics, we have bioinformatics workloads, which are pretty regular in some cases, and this causes high address translation overheads. Why? Because as I described before, we have high latency page table walks, and we also have really frequent page table walks. This is an example, this is a plot where we demonstrate the page table walk latency for two uh, schemes. One, the baseline scheme, which uses the x86 Radix based page table, and a second scheme, which uh, uses a state of the art uh, page table design called Elastic Kukuhasing. It's another design of the page table. And as you can observe, even if we use a state of the art page table, the hash based page table, then we spend 86 cycles on average to access it, which is really high. We also have really frequent page table walks. So in this plot, we demonstrate in the y axis the L2 TLB misses per kilo instructions. How frequent do we have misses in the L2 TLB across a wide range of differently sized TLBs, ranging from 1.5 kilo entries up to 64K entries. And as you will observe, even with the largest 64K entry L2 TLB, we experience an MPKI of 24 on average, which is a pretty high number. What does this translate to? We have high latency page table walks, frequent page table walks, and together we have high performance overheads. And at the same time, we create interference in the memory hierarchy between actual data and page table data. To give you an, uh, an example here, this is the speed up of a scheme that uses a perfect TLB. We always hit in the L1 TLB with no performance overhead compared to the state of the art page table, the elastic Kukuhasing. And as you can observe, if we completely avoid address translation completely, this leads to an average performance of 31% higher than the baseline scheme, which means that we have a lot of headroom to improve upon in terms of performance. With respect to the interference, in the same plot, we show the number of row buffer conflicts. We have discussed in the course, I guess, a lot about row buffers and row buffer conflicts. In this plot, we demonstrate if we avoid completely the address translation using a perfect TLB, we can reduce basically the uh, row buffer conflicts by 30% compared to the baseline system, just because we avoided loading page table data from the main memory, which again gives us a huge headroom to improve upon, especially in multi-core systems where the interference is really uh, important to handle. So what's an idea of prior works? If we restrict the virtual address to physical address mapping, then we can perform faster address translation. And what does that mean? For example, on the left, we have the virtual address space, and we want to map it to the physical address space. And you would use a hash function. We do not use anymore the page table. So we want to map this page 110 to the physical address space, we pass it through a hash mask, and we find out that it matches with the third page in the physical address space. What's the problem with that? If we use a, a restrictive mapping across the entire memory, then we have two key drawbacks. First, we cannot, uh, we limit core virtual memory functionality such as data sharing. If I go back to the example, this, the third virtual page, 00110, cannot map to any other page in the physical address page. It can only map to this one. If I had another process using another virtual page, we may not be able to map it to that one, which is the physical page of the shared library. And this way, we basically break the functionality of sharing. You can stop me also if you have any questions. And second, we increase the swapping activity since the system cannot map virtual pages to free physical pages. Again, in the same example, let's say that this page is the only one which is not, uh, is, is not it's the only one, the 0010, which is uh, occupied by, the, by, by some process. And all the other ones are free. Even if all the other ones are free, we need to map our page there. We cannot map it to any other of the four pages. So we need to basically send it and swap it back to the disk. There's no other way. 
In this plot, we demonstrate the swapping activity, how many swap scenes you do, when you use only the restrictive mapping compared to the fully flexible mapping. And as you can see, if we use only the restrictive mapping, we increase the swapping activity, the swap pins, by 2.37x, which is a really, which can cause really high performance degradation, as you might have seen in your desktops or laptops when the swapping activity is high. So what's the goal in this work? We want to design a virtual to physical address mapping scheme that provides fast and efficient address translation using a restrictive hash-based mapping while we enjoy the benefits of the conventional fully flexible address mapping. And we come up with Utopia. So Utopia is a new virtual to physical mapping scheme that enables both the restrictive mapping and the flexible mapping to harmoniously coexist in the system. So the idea is we use two types of physical memory segments, the restrictive segments and the flexible segments. Let's see the restrictive segment. The restrictive segment will have a virtual page number. We pass it through a hash function. It maps only to one page. It cannot map to any other page. We have fast address translation because we only pass it through a hash function, but limited vir virtual memory functionalities. And at the same time, we have the flexible segments. You have the virtual page number. You pass it through the page table, and you can map it to any page inside the physical memory. This supports all conventional virtual memory features at the cost of higher address translation latency. Let's discuss the properties of the restrictive segment, and then let's discuss how we serve address translation for data that reside in a restrictive segment. With respect to the structural properties, the restrictive segment, imagine it uh, as a set associative cache. It operates the same way as a set associative hardware, as the set associative hardware cache operate. This is an example. We have a two-way associative restrictive segments with two sets. Each one of the entries stores a four kilobyte page. We assume a page size of four kilobytes, which is a norm in uh, modern systems. It has two sets. Each one of the sets has two ways, same way as normal hardware caches work. And why is that good? Because with set associativity, same way as in caches, we have higher flexibility. If we cannot place our data in one of the sets, then we will, uh, in one of the ways, then we will set in another way. We can use multiple restrictive segments in the system. Why is that? First, we can use one restrictive segment with a page size of four kilobytes, which is again the baseline page size in the modern systems. But for example, Linux uses a transparent huge page mechanism where you can use also two megabyte pages instead of only four kilobyte. And this way, Utopia keeps backwards compatibility with large page mechanisms, existing and new ones, because we can also come up with new sizes. If an ARM developer, ARM uses four page sizes, comes up with a new version of Linux transparent huge pages that uses four different page sizes, then we can come up with four restrictive segments, one for each size or more than one for each size. How does other translation get resolved for data in the restrictive segment? So let's say that we have a virtual page, right? And we know that our virtual page should map to this physical page. And somehow we need to find this out. And the question is, how do we find out the physical location of the virtual page inside the restrictive segment? With uh, two components, two operations, tag matching and set filtering. I will explain to you first tag matching, and then we will see how we can improve upon tag matching using the set filtering. So tag matching requires comparing the tags of all the ways with the tag of the virtual page. And the tag, the tar, the tag array, tar, is an array that stores the tag of each entry. So we have the virtual address. We pass it through the hash function of the restrictive seg segment. And we come up with a set index and a tag. So we know to which set it belongs to. And we know it's tag as well. So we go to the set. And we find out, we search the first way. And we find out that the tags match. And in this case, we perform a tag matching operation. And the question is, do we always have to do tag matching? Does anyone have any idea? In which cases we do not need to do tag matching? I will give you the answer. So if a set is empty, then there is no reason why you would go and search all the ways to see if there's a tag matching, because we know that the set is empty, right? So we introduce set filtering, which is an operation that quickly discovers if a set in the restrictive segment is empty or not. And this way, we filter the tag mismatches. The set filter is an array of counters that keep track of the number of pages inside each set. 
which is essentially the cardinality of the set. We pass the virtual address to the hash function. We find the set number. We access the set filter, and we find out in this scenario that the page is in the first set, right? And the first set, the first bit is set to one, which means that the set is not empty. So we need to proceed normally to tag matching after this set filtering operation. If the page, uh, if the set index was one, then we would skip tag matching because the set would be empty and we did not need to perform any match with the tags. How does address translation look end-to-end uh, -end in Utopia? So in this scenario, the system employs two restrictive segments, one for four kilobytes and one for two megabyte pages, and one flexible segment. The whole memory is organized as a flexible, se as a flexible segment, and we also have two separate restrictive segments. Upon an L1 TLB miss, when we're missing the L1 TLB, we perform the restrictive segment walks, this process that I talked to you about, these two operations, and we also perform the L2 TLB access. And this, after we miss in all of these, and we cannot figure out where is our data, we perform in the page table walk, the normal page table walk. And this way, we can find out where our data resides in the physical memory. Let's see the key challenges of Utopia. First, which data should be placed inside the restrictive segment? Which pages should be placed on that? And why? What, how would they benefit? Second, so how, how can we maintain restrictive segments in the systems along with flexible segments? What about migrating data from one to another? How do we allocate? How do we replace? And third, how can we integrate Utopia and the other translation pipeline? How, what sort of hardware support do we need to make the restrictive segment work faster, for example? Let's focus on the first challenge. Our goal is to place costly to translate pages in a restrictive segment. Why? If a page is deemed to be costly to translate, it always results in higher translation latency. We put it in the restrictive segment, and this way, we do not need to access the page table anymore. We pass through a hash function, and we do other translation quickly. And we propose two techniques to perform the data placement in Utopia, a page fault based allocation policy, and a page table walk tracking-based migration policy. The first policy is pretty straightforward. Whenever we have a minor page fault, or a major page fault in some cases, the page is directly allocated in the restrictive segment. Upon a page fault, we allocate directly in the restrictive segment. So the question is the following. Let's say that the restrictive segment is full, and we start now to do some replacements. Then we don't want to go to the replacement cycle. We will keep it in the flex seg. But if we keep it in the flex seg, then how do we figure out if a page is costly to translate if it resides in a flexible segment? That's why we came up with a page table walk tracking based migration policy. How does that work? We use some unused bits of the page table entries of the page table as a counter that tracks the number and the cost of page table walks for each page. So let's say that the page performs multiple number of page table walks, which are pretty costly in terms of cycles. We keep track of that inside the page table entry. So the page table entry stores, for example, the physical frame number and some other data, read, write, access, dirty bits. We extend it with the page table uh, PTE counters. When these counters, for example, the page table, page table work frequency is larger than 10, we find out that this page is really costly to translate, and we need to migrate it inside the restrictive segment. Second, how do we maintain the restrictive segments in the system? We extend basically the operating system in a minimal way to achieve that. First, we handle allocations in a restrictive segment, replacements in a restrictive segment, and migrations to and from a restrictive segment. This is an example of allocation. We pass the VPN through the hash function. We access the tag array. We find out that there is a free way from the tag array. That's really cool. We store the data there. No need for migration. Everything is perfect. Second scenario. We want to discover again if there is a free way in the set, but there is no way free in the set. And it's not the page fault. So we need to evict the page, unfortunately, from the restrictive segment because every way of the set is full. How do we evict the page? We need to migrate. So the DMA engine is responsible for migrating uh, data between restrictive segments and flexible segments. Uh, for the people that don't know, the DMA engine is basically a hardware component that sits somewhere in your motherboard, let's say, and it accesses directly the main memory. The core, the core does not need to be involved, and it's responsible for 
uh, for example, for page migrations in, uh, inside the memory without involving the CPU at all. And how do we integrate Utopia and the other translation pipeline? Basically, we introduce something I call a restrictive segment walker in the MMU. So as you can see, what's the restrictive segment walker? We need to access somehow the translation structures of Utopia, which is of RESTEGS, which is the set filter and the tag array. We access them and we introduce two components, a TARCAS and an SFCAS. The TARCAS stores the recently accessed elements of the tag array, and the SFCAS st stores the recently accessed elements of the SF. If we miss in these caches, we need to retrieve those data structures from the memory hierarchy, but at a much lower cost. Why? Because they're much smaller compared to the page table. This is a scenario where uh, we have a page that resides inside the restrictive segment, and we want to see right now how we modify the memory management unit to perform other translation for this um, scenario. Upon an L1 miss TLB, we perform the restrictive segment walk. Okay. And at the same time, we access in parallel the L2 unified TLB. The L2 unified TLB needs to stall because it needs to wait for the result of a restrictive segment walker. The restrictive segment walker says, okay, data is inside the restrictive segment. I will provide to you the physical address immediately. And we abort the flexible segment walker. The page table walk is aborted. So if in our case, in, in this case, we needed to perform before a page table walk, now we completely abort it and we trade it with a restrictive segment walk, which is much cheaper than the page table walk. Second scenario. The page resides in a flexible segment. It's not in the restrictive segment. Again, we probe in parallel the, the restrictive segment walker and the L2TLB. The L2TLB needs to wait until the result from the restrictive segment walker comes. Data is not there. Data is not in the restrictive segment. So the TLB is not stalled anymore. It triggers the page table walker, and the page table walker informs us about the physical location of the data. Tells us that the data is inside the flexible segment. What about area and power overheads of all these changes? We evaluated using MacPat. It's a tool that's used uh, heavily in computer architecture papers. And we compared it to a high-end Intel Raptor Lake. Utopia includes a 0.64% area and 0.72% power overhead per core. And this is, um, about, this is mainly due to the additional caching components we introduced in the memory management unit. Let's see right now the evaluation results. What's our evaluation methodology? We use the Sniper multi-core simulator, uh, extended with page table walkers, page table caches. We use the body allocator, which emulates how the body system works in the operating system memory manager. And we also model the migration latency. And I will talk to you about this later. We, have a, we had a poster in the same conference that introduces the simulation framework for virtual memory research that we built uh, on top of this, which is called Virtuoso. And it's available on GitHub as well. We executed workloads for 500 million instructions, and it's uh, across a diverse, as you can see, range of benchmark suites. With what did, you want, did we compare against uh, with respect to Utopia? The baseline Radix page table, and with transparent huge pages enabled, which means that we have both four kilobyte and two megabyte pages. POM TLB. POM TLB is a state-of-the-art large software managed TLB. We don't just learn, like, we do not just use a hardware TLB, we also use a really large software managed TLB. Whenever we miss in the hardware TLBs, we first probe the large software managed TLB to search for the translation. Elastic hashing, which is an alternative to the Radix page table, it's a state of the art hash based page table and it relies on hashing, which is a technique coming from uh, theory and uh, techniques on how you can hash in a more efficient manner. RMM, which is a scheme that leverages contiguity, virtual to physical contiguity, to accelerate other translation. And we use also Utopia. We use 512 megabyte restrictive segments, one for four kilobyte pages and one for two megabyte pages. And we also compare all these schemes with a perfect L1 TLB, where the translation requests always hit in the L1 TLB. Basically, there is no overhead because of other translation. And this gives us basically an idea of how close is our mechanism uh, to the perfect scheme. 
In this plot, we demonstrate the speed up over the baseline system radix of all these um, design points. And as we can observe, Utopia performs the second best performing scheme, which is the contiguity of wireless translation, by 13%, and the radix based scheme by 24%. So basically, we had performed the baseline by 24%, which is a pretty significant result. Also, another significant result is that Utopia's performance is, is within 95% of the perfect TLB. So we achieve performance, which is really close to the headroom of what we can achieve. Where does this performance increase come from? From the reduction in the translation latency. So in this plot, we demonstrate the reduction in the translation latency for all the schemes compared to the baseline system. And as you will observe, Utopia reduces the average translation latency by 63% over Radix and 14% of the RMM, the redundant memory mappings. What about mem memory interference? Because we discussed that address translation causes high main memory interference. In this plot, we demonstrate the normalized DRAM row buffer conflicts, um, all normalized across the baseline system of all the evaluated schemes. And as you can observe, Utopia reduces the row buffer conflicts by 20% of radix and 9% less than perfect TLB. Again, we're really close to the headroom, basically, which is the perfect TLB scheme. There are many more results and details in the paper. Sensitivity across different hash functions, sensitivity to parallel and serial TLB access, and the restrictive segment walk, sensitivity to the restrictive segment size, reuse level distribution of four kilobyte pages, how we can, uh, what's the effect of migration on memory requests, What's the hit rate of the TAR and the CFCAS? And what's the overhead across different context switch quanta? You can find the most up-to-date version on archive. As a conclusion, we propose Utopia, a new virtual to physical mapping scheme that enables both restrictive mapping and flexible mapping to harmoniously coexist in the system. Utopia achieves 13% higher performance in the state-of-the-art contiguity aware translation scheme and 95% of the performance of an ideal perfect TLB. And Utopia is open source, you can check the GitHub link. I'm open to questions, discussions. If you didn't understand something or whether you have an idea. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, we're doing uh, uh, both the TLB, the L2 TLB access uh, in parallel with uh, the restrictive segment walk. Uh, yes, uh, correct. And the L2 TLB uh, stalls for a couple Correct. of, of yeah. time, uh, for a period of time. Uh, how would this affect uh, the overall performance? That's a really good question. This is a question we received from the reviewers as well. So um, basically, we added an evaluation to the paper uh, because of this question. So this um, basically slows down the worst case scenario, right? If data is not in the restrictive segment, then you have paid some cycles where you stole the TLB, the L2 TLB access, and you wait until you trigger the page stable walk. So we demonstrate that this uh, drops performance by around two to three percent, but overall, um, it gives it it provides still provides high benefits doing that. Uh, although it poses, if you enable everything in parallel, right, then this imposes an energy and performance trade-off. You perform more access to the TLB for no reason, let's say, because you might not need to trigger the page stable walk. And then you need to play with this trade-off, right? You need to understand what are your energy savings and what do you also consume in terms of latency. Is it possible to start the flexible uh, page walk uh, and then interrupt it when, let's say, the uh, the first part to say yes. I have the data. It is possible. Basically, there are mechanisms right now inside the core. There is hardware circuitry where you need to abort. You can abort the page table walks. It's not only for this process specifically, but yes, generally there are, there are some let's say mechanisms with which you can send a message to the page table worker and say abort. Do not perform access anymore. Yes, this is how you would do it. For example. Okay. Thank you. You discuss different policies on how to how to yes. choose which page to put in the restrict, restricted segment. 
Do you think a reinforcement learning approach would be better in this case? So as I will show you in the next paper, uh, we had a, so these thresholds that I talked about, they did not come like randomly. So imagine we did a full feature engineering of uh, several features of the program to see wh what is a good decision tree and a good comparator so that we can figure out our thresholds. So right now we took this approach and the accuracy, as I will show you later, is around 82% in terms of identifying costly to translate pages. You are correct, though, that it should be probably more dynamic than that. If someone can come up with a mechanism where you figure out on a, online what should be the benefit of placing a page there or not, that would be also really good. Because then you don't have just a static model that relies on some offline profiling. Have an online tool that does that. And you can take into account other factors, memory bandwidth consumption, interference, et cetera, which you cannot take uh, when you have a static feature engineering process. Yes, you're correct. It's possible. Any other question? So we have the hardest stop at four. What time is it? Eight twenty-two. Okay. Yeah, I think I'll be done by four. <laughs> I hope I'll be done by four. <laughs> Okay, so the second paper we're going to discuss today, it's called Victima, drastically increasing address translation reads by leveraging the underutilized cache resources. It was recently again presented at Micro in the same session as Utopia. It also was artifact evaluated. That's why you can see the four badges on the top. And it's again a collaborative work between multiple institutions. Let's see first the executive summary and let's quickly discuss the problem. So we have uh, address translation, which is, as I discussed before, a major performance bottleneck in data intensive workloads. Why? Because we have large data sets and irregular memory access patterns that lead to frequent L2 TLB misses. For example, we have 20 to 50 uh, misses per kilo instructions in the L2 TLB. And this causes frequent high latency page table walks. So we pay around 100 to 150 cycles to do a page table walk in modern systems. What's the motivation, motivation behind this work? We want to increase the address translation latency, which is the memory covered by the TLBs, how much, how, what's the amount of memory that you can cover with the TLBs. And this way, we want to reduce the page table walks. However, if we employ large TLBs, this leads to increased area power and latency overheads, as I will show you later. What's the opportunity that we saw? We want to increase the translation reach of the TLB hierarchy by storing the existing TLB entries within the existing CAS hierarchy. And we came up with Victima, a new software transparent scheme that drastically increases the address translation reach of the processor's TLB hierarchy by leveraging the underutilized CAS resources. What's the key idea? We want to transform DL2 CAS blocks that store page table entries into blocks that store TLB entries. Right now, in the two cas we store page table entries, page table data. We want to transform them to TLB entries. And what does this offer? We can directly access the TLB entries with a virtual address. We do not do it to walk the page table. What are the key benefits of this scheme? Efficient in native and virtualized environments. It's fully transparent to application and OS software. And it's also compatible with huge page schemes. We can basically cache, do the same operation for both four kilobyte pages and two megabyte pages. What are the key results? We had performed, a victim outperforms a, a state of the art large TLB design by 5.1% and achieves similar performance to an optimistically fast 128K entry L2 TLB without the associated power, energy, area overhead that it brings. Utopia, a victim is open source. You can find it under this handling. 
this is the outline of the talk. Let's dive into some background. I kept the background here a bit shorter because I already gave you a pretty detailed background before. So again, we have the page table which stores all the visual to physical address mappings. It's organized as a four or a five level radix tree. And we need to access it, we need to perform a page table walk. Again, how do we perform the page table walk? We first load the CR3 register that points to the root of the tree. We use the nine bits as an offset inside the frame of the page table. We iteratively do this process. We load all the intermediate pointers until we reach the leaf. When we reach the leaf, we retrieve the physical frame number. And as I discussed before, this leads to four sequential memory accesses during a page table walk in x 64 systems. What does the address translation flow look like? We ship the address to the memory management unit and we access the page table. Again, here this is critical. I'm going to deliver it again. We have two TLBs, the L1 TLB, instruction TLB, and the L1 data TLB. Whenever we want to service translations for instructions, we probe the L1 instruction. Whenever we want to do the same for data, we probe the L1 data TLB. Whenever we're missing those structures, we access the unified L2 TLB. Whenever we miss, we trigger the page table walk. The page table walk uses the page walk caches and intermediate caching structures, and we access the page table. An important detail here, whenever we evict something from a unified L2 TLB, which is a direct virtual to physical translation, this is vanishes from the system. This goes nowhere. And I will show you later why is that bad. In this example, I show you the other translation overhead. And this is basically the number of occurrences of different page table walk latencies. These are bins of page table walk latencies. And you can see here that the mean, the average page table walk latency is 137 cycles, which is extremely expensive in terms of performance, especially when the L2TLB miss ratio is high. Imagine if we have a high L2TLB miss ratio, we will pay every time a page table walk that costs approximately, on average, 137 cycles. We have high latency page table walks and frequent page table walks, which lead to high performance overheads. And what's the potential solution to that? We want to reduce the frequency of the page table walks by increasing the address translation reads. And let's define right now what is address translation reads. It's the amount of virtual to physical address mappings stored by the processor's TLB hierarchy. We have a modern processor, for example. This is the whole number of mappings that can be stored in the TLB hierarchy of the processor. And I'm talking now about the whole TLB, right? L1 TLBs and L2 TLBs. And we can fit, for example, three to four gigabytes of memory. We want to increase this. Why do we want to increase this? Because this way we can have a much larger reach. These three, four gigabytes can become five, 10 gigabytes. And this way, if we can cover so much memory, then we will reduce the amount of page table walks. We can keep inside the core many of these virtual to physical address mappings. One potential way of doing that, we employ large hardware TLBs. And in this plot, we demonstrate the L2 TLB and BKI, how the misses per kilo instructions of the L2 TLB, ranging from 1.5K entry L2 TLB up to 64K entry L2 TLB. And as you can see, if we use a 64K entry L2 TLB, we can reduce the MPKI from 39 to 24. So we were successful. We reduced the MPKI by increasing the hardware L2 TLB size. And in this plot, we demonstrate the speed up that we achieve over the baseline system that uses a simple uh, 1.5K entry L2 TLB compared to an optimistic system that uses a 64K entry L2 TLB with the same latency, access latency, as the 1.5K entry L2 TLB. And we can see that we also succeeded. The 64K entry L2 TLB with an optimistic access latency provides 5.4% speed up over the baseline system. However, is this realistic? You can answer also if you want. Is this a realistic design option that uh, if I increase by 64X, the size of the hardware TLB, the access latency remains the same. I guess it's not. Uh, so we did an experiment where we tune realistically the access latency of the L2 TLB. And we find out that using a 64K entry L2 TLB with the realistic, latency, the realistic access latency, which is around 39 cycles in this scenario, leads to only 0.8% speed up over the baseline system, which, makes, which basically hinders its adoption uh, as a potential solution. 
A second way of increasing the address translation rates, we can employ large software managed still bees. We're going to deliver some background on that. So we have an MMU, right? And as I said before, it has an L2 TLB where we store, it's the last level of the TLB where we store the direct virtual to physical mappings. And then normally we trigger a page table walk if we miss. In this scenario, we first look up a, a software L3 TLB. It's a structure that stores again direct uh, virtual to physical mappings, but it's stored inside the main memory. It's not stored in hardware components. It's also cacheable in the caches. You fetch it in the caches normally as a page table, but it's much smaller than the page table. This uh, software L3 TLB, it's organized as a set associative hash table, basically, and it needs contiguous physical other space in memory. So what are the drawbacks? Really high latency. We need to access the main memory to fetch the software TLB. It needs contiguous physical allocations, which are really hard to find, especially when the memory is highly fragmented, for example, in data centers. And also requires non-minimal operating system modifications. So imagine that whenever we want to, let's say, evict data from the L2 TLB to the software L3 TLB, we need to perform some sort of uh, replacement from the software L3 TLB back to the L2 TLB, et cetera. So the OS needs to be involved in these processes right now. Before, when it comes to hardware TLBs, the, the OS is unaware of that, it's agnostic to that. So right now we introduce additional um, burden on the operating system side. So we figure out that large hardware TLBs and large software managed TLBs come with major drawbacks. And we want to approach the problem differently. So we saw an opportunity of leveraging the caches to increase the address translation rates. So we want to store TLB entries in the hardware caches. For example, when we uh, right now evict an entry from the L2 TLB, it goes nowhere, it vanishes. In this scenario, it's placed inside the L2 cache. We spam and we feed the L2 cache with TLB entries. And whenever we have a miss uh, upon the um, TLB entries that we evicted before, we abort the page table walk. Why? Because we found our TLB entry inside the L2 cache. And this way we can service address translation much faster compared to performing a page table walk. Where's the benefit in that? A modern system using L2 TLB with 1.5K entries, a 12 cycle access latency. A, a modern system also uses a two megabyte L2 cache that fits 36 more TLB entries and has much lower latency, 16 cycles. A reminder here that the page table walk takes 137 cycles on average. And what about interference with program data? Will my TLB entries interfere with program data and basically destroy the performance of uh, data that I place normally in the caches? So we found out uh, using this plot, we demonstrate the breakdown of L2 data block reuse, which means how many times did I touch my data after I brought it inside the L2 cache? Did I touch it zero times? One to five, five to 10, 10 to 20, more than 20. And the answer is the L2 cache is heavily underutilized. As you will observe, more than 85% of the times we bring the data inside the L2 cache and we never touch it again, which makes it a really good candidate. These blocks, which are normally called dead blocks, they make a really good candidate for storing TLB entries. Let's see an overview of our mechanism. We want to leverage uh, the cache resources to store TLB entries. And this way we can drastically increase the address translation reach of the processor. What's the key idea? We want to repurpose the L2 cache blocks to store clusters of TLB entries. So we have a low latency and high capacity component to back up the L2 TLB. That's the overview of Victima. Whenever we have a miss or an eviction from the L2 TLB, we use a component, a new one, which is called the page table cost estimator. The page table cost estimator asks the question, is the page cost to translate? If yes, then what will happen? We will transform the PTE block into a TLB block. And this way, next time we perform the access to this uh, page, we will not uh, perform the page table walk. We will retrieve it back from the L2 cache with low latency. What are the benefits of this approach? Drastic increase in address translation reads full transparency to application and OS software. There is no need for contiguous physical allocations, same way as the software managed TLBs. 
and it's compatible with huge pages. Why? We can store translations, still be entries for both four kilobyte pages, two megabyte pages, 16 kilobyte pages, and any possible page size. Let's see the detailed design of Victima. I'm going to describe to you the L2CAS modifications we need to do, the allocation of TLB entries inside the L2CAS, and the page table cost predictor. First, we need to modify the L2CAS to access TLB blocks using a virtual address. This is not possible right now in the L2CAS. And second, we need to perform tag matching for TLB blocks. An example cache configuration, we use a one megabyte cache, 16-way associative. And just as a heads up here, the send index, we have agreed that it's 10 bits. OK, first, let's see the structure of a conventional data block. So we extend the metadata of the data block with an additional bit to distinguish between the data blocks and the TLB blocks. And in the data block, the TLB entry is set to 0. And the conventional data block stores 64 bytes, which means that we need 6 bits for the offset. And as we showed before, the set index is 10 bits. And the rest 36 bits of the physical address constitute the tag. So let's see right now the structure of a TLB block. In this scenario, the TLB entry is set to 1. And in this scenario, we use as well a virtual page number to access the TLB block. We don't need a physical address. So the TLB block contains of eight uh, contiguous, uh, the translations of eight contiguous virtual pages because we have a 64 byte cache line we can put inside eight page table entries. So how many off offset bits do we need? Three. If we want to access the page at index zero, we uh, use an offset of zero. Set, bin, set index remains the same, it's 10 bits. And the rest 23 bits are reserved for the tag. And what's the key difference between these two? The tag is much smaller in this scenario. And this flexibility allows us to use some additional bits, like the address specific identifier, which you can imagine it as a process identifier, um, along with the page size. We can use this additional 13 bits to store it there. And this is really useful when we perform tag matching. So how do we perform tag matching? We have a virtual address. We ask the question, is the TLB entry set? If yes, we check the tags. If the tags are the same, then we proceed to the next comparison, the other specific identifier. If these are the same, then we use the offset and we pick which page table entry this virtual address corresponds to. In this example, it corresponds to the third, fourth one, for example. Then, how does Victima allocate TLB entries inside the L2CAS? On a TLB miss and on an L2 TLB, uh, on an L2 -TLB eviction. On an L2 TLB miss, we first uh, trigger the page table walker as normally, and we uh, fetch the page table entry block inside the CAS hierarchy. In this scenario, we also consult the page table cost estimator. If it says that the page is costed to translate, we also transform the PTE block into a TLB block. So we don't have any more a PTE block, we have a direct TLB block. Second, L2 TLB eviction. We evict data from the L2 TLB. What's the problem here? We cannot trigger the page table walk in the normal, as in the normal scenario. We need to trigger it asynchronously. It consults again the page table walk cost estimator. And then we again transform the block into a TLB block for the evicted page right now, not for the page that missed in the L2 TLB. How does translation, other translation look in victim end to end? Whenever we have an L2 TLB miss, we trigger the page table walk asynchronously. At the same time, we take a look at the L2 cache and we find out that the L our TLB block resides in the L2 cache and it's a hit. So what do we do? As we discussed before, we abort the page table walk. The bad scenario, we trigger the a miss and the page table walk in parallel. We probe the L2 cache. We do not find our data there. Page table walker is not aborted. We continue the page table walk process as normally. How did we create, how did we design the page table cost predictor, which goes back to the question? We want to predict which pages are costly to translate and insert only those TLB blocks in the L2 cache. How do we track them? In the page table entry, we have two features, frequency and the cost. And whenever we do a page table walk, we update these counters. If so, we fetch these counters inside the page table walk cost estimator, we pass it through a comparator tree and we decide if the page is costly to translate or not. And if 
the MPKI of the L2 cache, which means the pressure at the L2 cache is not high, then we always um, assume that uh, is not is always high, which means that data do not benefit from the L2 cache. Then we always assume that the page is costly to translate. We do not need to consult anything. We know that our tail binders will not cause a problem inside the L2 cache. How did we find out the comparator tree? We performed feature engineering to find a minimal set of features. And we used a two-feature comparator that predicts costly translate pages with the 82% accuracy. This is the whole feature set that we tested. We did feature engineering. We find uh, that the um, uh, page table will cost and the page table will frequency are the most important and critical features. And as you can see, we did some sort of exploration across different neural network architectures from really big ones, like this five uh, feature neural network with uh, 64 hidden layers. This is extremely big. Um, and we perform a two, uh, we find out finally that our two feature comparator approach, we just put it into a bounding box, predicts costly to translate pages with 82% accuracy. What about virtualized environments? In virtualized environments, we need two, two level address translation from guest virtual to host virtual to host physical. And the L2 TLB right now stores guest virtual to host physical translations. There's another component in modern process called the nested TLB, which stores guest virtual to host virtual addresses. How does your victim work in this scenario? Hey, we just spam the L2 cache with both nested TLB entries and L2 TLB entries. And this way, we can accelerate translation in both native and virtualized environments. Let's see the evaluation methodology. I will not spend a lot of time in that. The same evaluation methodology is the one we used in uh, Utopia. But the configuration change. So we use a baseline system with two page sizes. Optimistic L2 TLB with 64K entries. Optimistic L2 TLB with 128K entries. The software managed TLB, large software managed TLB, and Victima. As you can see in this plot, we demonstrate the speed up over the baseline system. And you can observe that Victima achieves a similar performance to the optimistically fast 128K entry L2 TLB, which is a really significant result because we avoid the associated overheads with uh, that intro get introduced with the 128K entry L2 TLB. How, uh, where does this performance benefit come from? From the reduction of page table walks. So in this plot, we demonstrate the reduction of page table walks across these uh, four designs, the large software managed TLB, the two large L2 hardware TLBs, and Victima. And we observe that Victima reduces the page table walks by 50% on average compared to the baseline system. So let's see how Victima scales along with the cache size. We see increase in cache sizes from 2 megabytes up to 8 megabytes. We see that Victima, by employing an 8 megabyte L2 cache, it reduces page table walks by 63%, which means that it scales well as we increase the cache size. What did we compare against it in virtualized environments? Nested paging, which is the baseline system that performs a two-level address translation. Again, the software managed TLB, and a system that performs directly virtual to physical translations without going through the two-level translation. We find out from the guest virtual directly the host physical address translation. How does performance look like? Victima outperforms a 64K entry software managed TLB, which is the state of the art right now in literature, by 12%, which is, again, a significant performance result. At what area in power overhead? Again, we evaluate using MacPat. We compare to a high-end Raptor Lake, and we see that Victima incurs only 0.04% area and 0.08% power overheads. Why? Because there is no actual modification or any additional component that we add inside the, or heavy major component that we add inside the microarchitecture. There's more in the paper, which you can find updated uh, into archive. Victima is open source, and it won the Distinguished Artifact Award in Micro 2023. You can find the code there. You can reproduce the results and play along with the uh, code base that we provided. I provided some documentation as well for people who are interested and want to take a look. And to conclude, we present Victima, a new software transparent scheme that drastically increased the translation rate of the processor still be hierarchy by leveraging the underutilized cache resources. Key idea, transform the L2 cache blocks that store page table entries into blocks that store uh, TLB entries. 
This way, we can directly access them using the virtual addresses. We had performed the state-of-the-art software managed CLB by 5.1% and achieved similar performance to an optimistically fast 128K entry L2 TLB design without the associated area and power overheads. It's open source, you can find it again on this GitHub link. Any questions, discussion? When uh, you populate the L2 CAS, the TLB either uh, from the nested OS or even for the virtual uh, yeah. to physical memory address, wouldn't that lead to CAS pollution and evict maybe actual data that you need for co computation? Yes, yeah, so that's why in the page table cost estimator, we take into account the L2 CAS, right? Uh, the L2 CAS MPKI. So if there is really low pressure, in the L2 cast, which means that, for example, I run a matrix multiplication workload, right? Really high locality. L2 cast is really helpful. In this scenario, the L2 cast, the, the page table cost estimator would not see many page table walks or many um, misses in the L2 TLB. So there is a natural, so to, to answer more holistically, there is a natural tendency that the more pressure I receive in my caches, the higher the MPKI of the cache the more, the higher it is my address translation problem. So they go hand in hand. If your workload does not experience high uh, address, high uh, cache MPKI, which means the caches work perfectly, usually, or most of the times, uh, address translation is not a problem. So address translation becomes a problem when you have a large data set, right? That don't fit in the caches and you have irregular memory access patterns. So as they go hand in hand, you will benefit. Of course, if you would place TLB entries inside when you run matrix multiplication, of course you would pollute actual data, right? That's why the page table cost estimator um, would not would consult you against trashing the actual data. Is that clear? Yeah. For the benchmark, I'm interested. Did you test on virtual machines as well, or is it only host uh, benchmarks? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. For for the um, for the benchmarks that you present, um, is it only host benchmarks, or also in virtual machines? So imagine this as a it's guest. It's always guest. It's a virtual machine. Uh, the host usually does not run the benchmarks, right? The host is usually, let's say, some sort of hypervisor. So imagine you have guest VMs, right? The guest operating systems that run their workloads. So that's what you evaluate here. If we, if you evaluate benchmarks from the host, like the, the host runs a benchmark, then you don't need a virtualized address translation. You can do the single level address translation because you only need to translate from host virtual to host physical. So you will see the higher overheads of address translation when the guest basically executes the benchmark, not when the host executes the benchmark. I mean, this is called native execution, right? It's not called host execution. How much time do we have? 10 minutes. I was trained for eight, <laughs> for the next one, I mean. Oh, eight minutes. It was eight. Okay, and I'm going to, last but not least, talk to you about Virtuoso, which is an open source comprehensive and modular simulation framework for virtual memory research, which we also uh, presented in micro in the student research competition. Okay, we want to improve virtual memory. Why? It causes high performance overheads, and there are multiple academic and industrial solutions which were proposed to reduce these overheads. We can improve the TLB sum system. We can employ larger page sizes. We can leverage virtual to physical contiguity. We can rethink the page tables and introduce new page table designs. We can reduce the latency of minor and major page faults, fetching from the disk, for example, or allocating memory in the physical space. We can also employ better address mappings, as I showed you with Utopia. And we need to evaluate these virtual memory solutions. We need a way to effectively evaluate these virtual memory techniques, which is crucial for progress in the domain. What are the requirements? We need to flexibly model any, many uh, virtual memory schemes. 
We need to model the interactions between the virtual memory components, and we also need to uh, demonstrate and evaluate the impact of virtual memory techniques on the system. How does virtual memory affect the caches and the main memory? Let's talk about the flexibility first. Some researcher comes up with a new idea. So they need to compare against some designs, right? A TLB prefetcher, some sort of virtual caching, transparent huge pages. And we need to enable that. We need to give out a methodology and a tool for that. Second, we need to model for sure the interactions between virtual memory components. Let's give you an example of these interactions. We have the TLBs, which basically live and die based on the memory allocator. If the memory allocator gives four kilobyte pages only, the TLBs have a small reach. When the memory allocator starts giving out two megabyte pages to the TLBs, then the memory reach becomes much larger. The third one, impact of VM techniques in the system. An example, I demonstrate, I came up with a new page table design, right? And I figured out it has really low latency. That's extremely nice. My other translation overheads are gone, but I introduced lots of interference in the system. I break down everyone else's performance. I slow down every other application. And that's a bad design point. That's why we want to both understand what's other translation latency and as well, what's the impact on the system. We also have a lack of comprehensive simulators with respect to virtual memory. Gen5, ZSIM, Emulator, Sniper, ZAMSIM, they lack the capability to model a wide range of state-of-the-art virtual memory techniques. And there is a reason for that, as I will show you. What's our approach? We have this example simulator called Sniper, which has, let's say, three main components. They interconnect the memory subsystem and the out-of-order core. We have Virtuoso, which models all these nice components. We plug Virtuoso in the memory subsystem of Sniper. Whenever Sniper wants to perform other translation, it consults Virtuoso. What are the key benefits? Virtuoso is comprehensive, modular, and open source. You can find the GitHub link there. And there are many updates coming. Why is it comprehensive? It has a wide tool set. Four page table designs, six TLB schemes, MMU nesting for virtualized environments, schemes that employ intermediate other spaces, metadata schemes for protection, and two contiguity aware schemes. What is the key enabler of Virtuoso and modeling so many tools? It's the mini operating system we introduce for memory management. So we always need to somehow emulate and simulate the OS when we evaluate virtual memory ideas. We cannot go away with just simply emulating it because when you modify the operating system, for example, like I talked about introducing a reinforcement learning approach, right? Um, if you want to impose like a reinforcement learning approach in the system, this causes some additional overheads and I need to evaluate these overheads, not just emulate the functionality of these overheads. How do we do this? I'm gonna walk you quickly through that. We have this pageful handler, Right? It needs to deliver to us a physical page. That's what we requested. And we propagate the functional events to the virtuoso. I allocated this page, I promoted this page, and I pass all these events through a channel to the emulation part of the virtuoso. The virtuoso knows right now what functionally the pageful hunter would do. And the most critical part is the second part, is that we also create a channel for the microarchitectural events of the Pageful Handler. The Pageful Handler run uh, two instructions, an add immediate and a load. And we pass these events to, through another channel to the simulation part of Virtuoso. And this way we can make an estimation about the performance overhead that the Pageful Handler causes. And this is a major, basically, disadvantage of all other uh, trace-based or instrumentation-based simulators. It's modular. We can plug it into many simulators like ZSIM Sniper or Gen5, which is one of the state of the art in the field. And it's open source. Uh, you can find the GitHub link. There are many features coming up. Uh, you will see them soon. Some example use cases we compare against different memory management unit designs and effect of transparent huge pages on page table work latency. So, in this example, I showed you, for example, we wanted to compare against three, we, we compare it to each other four different memory management unit designs from academia and industry, let's say. And we find out, for example, that uh, the last one, RMM, works better than anyone else, right? And this is a really critical result because this way we can perform an effective comparison of our new idea with different designs. Second, we can, for example, check 
and estimate the effect of transparent huge pages on page table work latency. There's a large interplay between these two components. What do I show here? In the x-axis, we increase the fragmentation. What does that mean? We do not provide large pages. We only provide four kilobyte pages as we go right on the x-axis. And this is the normalized performance to the scenario where we only give two megabyte pages. And as you can observe, as we start giving four kilobyte pages, there is a trend. We lower the performance of the page table walker. Why? Because we don't have two megabyte pages to give. And identifying this interplay and effectively evaluating this interplay requires a good and comprehensive simulation framework. As a conclusion, we came up with Virtuoso. Uh, it's a good start for establishing a common ground for virtual memory research, and you can find it online under this GitHub link. Any questions? Something for discussion? We have two minutes for burning questions. I don't expect questions here, to be honest. <laughs> it's. Yeah, thanks a lot. You, you can uh, conclude this session. Yeah. yeah, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining. Uh, we presented six papers today, basically, uh, three of them on the topic of storage systems and three on virtual memory. And I hope you got a good overview of what's going on in cutting edge research in these two topics. So thanks a lot for joining.